Want to start things off for today by giving a big thank you to Tom Vecchio and Austin Swain, who filled in for me for the past two weeks here on the Solo Shock, giving you hopefully a very profitable insights. And it's a it's a very fun job to do doing the solo shot each day, but it is a lot of work. So I appreciate all the effort they did to allow me to go to my honeymoon in France and Spain, have a lot of bread and a lot of cheese, a lot of seafood, and now get back here to do what we love. Once again, talk some MLB DFS for today. So again, a big thank you to Tom Vecchio, Austin Swain. Check out Tom on Twitter at DFS underscore Tom. Austin Swain is at a Swain three on Twitter. Thank you to them. Thank you to everyone doing the draft stream for me too. Had a good time. Happy to be back here though to talk some more MLB DFS for you and what looks like a pretty fun slate for today because there are some good pitchers on the bump and I am excited to once again break it down with all of you. Welcome on into the solo shot that's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com here to break down Thursday's six game main slate with lock set for 640 5 p.m. Eastern for today. So it does include that Phillies versus Mets game at 6:45. If you tend to put things off, things off like I do, make sure you have your lineups entered by 6:45 p.m. Eastern to get them in before lock for today. Only one weather note for today. That is in San Francisco. Shockingly, pretty cold out there relative to the rest of the slate. It is 53 degrees there versus at least 60 or higher everywhere else. I assume the roof will be on in, in uh, T-Mobile Park today in, in Seattle, so should increase the temperature there at least a bit from where it typically is. So bump down bats for Cardinals and Giants in San Francisco as a result of the cool temperatures. We'll dive in and get you set for this slate in just one second, but first a quick reminder to make sure you are subscribed to the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts, of course. NBA, NHL now in the playoffs, but we do have a lot of other good stuff here on the uh, the Daily Fantasy Podcast feed. We have PGA, as of course, as always, MLB, UFC, NASCAR, those things chugging along here as always. So search for the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts. Hit subscribe if you like what you hear. Leave us a rating and review as well. Also, coming up on Saturday is the Kentucky Derby. The Derby is here, and there has never been a better time to get in on the action because new players can bet risk-free up to $200 on TVG. That is right. You can get up to $200 back inside credit on your first single horse win wager if your horse does not win. Plus, TVG's money back special gives every customer up to $10 cash back on select races if your horse finishes second or third. You will also get access to free picks, analysis, and so much more. Win or get your money back for the Derby with TVG. Sign up today at tvg.com slash cover or to bet risk-free up to $200. Again, the, the, the page that tvg.com slash cover, a la our betting podcast covering the spread. tvg.com slash cover will have a full breakdown of the Kentucky Derby with Megan Devine of TVG getting her thoughts on this year's Derby and some bets that she likes coming up later on today on the Covering the Spread podcast feed. Again, the, the entry, the site there, tvg.com slash cover. Let's dive into the pitching preview for this Thursday main slate. Logan Webb. Typically my guy, not as much today. He is $10,300. Shane McClanahan is 10-1. Aaron Nola, $9,900. Miles Miklas is 96. Tarek Skubal is 94. Jesus Lazardo is $9,100. Then we have Robbie Ray and Nick Martinez as the others at $8,000 or higher. Now looking at this slate, I do feel compelled and I'm very okay with ranking Shane McClanahan first for today. And I think that the performances that McClanahan has put forth this year really forced me to do this. He's been too good for me to deny so far. And I am looking at a small sample with McClanahan, but I'm okay looking at these small and what he did previously and throwing fewer sliders. And if you look back at last year, both those pitches, the curveball and the slider had, uh, or the curveball and the, the changeup had higher whiff rates for him than his slider. The key point of his slider is to generate whiffs, and it wasn't doing that as much as those two pitches were. And that's not typically how things work. It likely means McClanahan's slider is just okay. But you look at the curveball, gets a healthy amount of ground balls to that curveball. I think it's just a good pitch. 
With the changeup, the velocity this year is down on that from where it was last year. And that's while his fastball velocity is up a smidge. So the delta between his fastball velocity and his changeup velocity is increased. That's a very good thing. It's led to a 58% whiff rate on that pitch, according to Baseball Savant. It has been disgusting, and it makes sense given the gap between his fastball velocity and his changeup velocity. It's led to some pretty absurd numbers from McClanahan across his first five starts. He has a 39% strikeout rate. His fly ball rate allowed is just 26%. And it's allowed him to get seven plus strikeouts in all five starts. He had 11 last time out. And that's despite not going super deep into games just yet. I do think eventually we will see McClanahan uh, get the leash taken off. But his max pitch count so far is 90, which was where he was his last time out. I've got him projected for 88 for tonight. Despite that, you know, middling projection, he does still have the highest strikeout projection for me on this slate by a decent margin. He's facing the Mariners here. They're not a super high strikeout team, but they also don't hit for a ton of power. So I think that McClanahan is the top guy on the slate, and I feel pretty good about that. I feel comfortable putting him there and buying high off of the sweet start that he has had. So Shane McClanahan at 10-1 to me deserves to be the top guy, and I will rank him as such for today. Number two will be Aaron Nola, who did just face the Mets his last time out, and it's a bummer because we should downgrade him as a result of that familiarity they have with him from this year. Even downgrading Nola from there, though, I do still think he has to be number two for me behind McClanahan. Similar to last year, Nola's results, like his ERA type stuff, it's underwhelming. He has a 3.90 ERA this year, and his velocity is down. So you couple those two things together with the fact that he had bad results last year, it could be a cause for concern. But as is always the case with Nola, his peripherals are sick. He has a 2.21 skill interactive ERA with a 32% strikeout rate, and his ground ball rate, which had been down the past couple of years, is back up. It's 56% this year versus 41% last year. That all leads to an expected ERA at Baseball Savant of 2.29. So the results were annoying, and they were annoying last year too, but the strikeout upside is very good, and I think the results for Nola should get better as the year goes along. We've seen both those things, the good peripherals and bad results against the Mets and his two starts against them this year. He led three in runs in both those games. We don't want that. But last week, he did strike them out nine times. That game is on the road. Nola does traditionally get a bump at home. And he had nine strikeouts to start before that as well against a different team. I've got Nola projected for 7.3 strikeouts for today. That is second on the slate behind McClanahan. And McClanahan and Nola, the only two guys with a strikeout projection higher than 6.6. I think it means we have to put Nola second, even with his issues. So I don't feel great about it. I have been burned by Nola plenty of times. I did, When I recommend him, I use him. So if it's not worked out for you, it hasn't worked out for me either. But I do still think the process is there. So I will keep on using Nola for today. He is my number two pitcher behind uh, Shane McClanahan on this slate. Now, as far as the value guys go, guy goes, I went into this assuming Jesus Lazardo would be the value because he's facing the Padres. It's a bad matchup, but I'm fine with that if he is the value play. So I went into this thinking, okay, I'll write up, um, I'll have to talk about McClanahan, talk about Nola for the studs, and then get Lazardo as a value play. But he's 91, and I typically want to go below 9,000. That could have been annoying, but the saving grace is that Robbie Ray is instead of value, $8,900, and. Ray's been pretty bad this year, but I think that's a big enough discount where I will happily ride with him despite those issues. And, you know, Ray is here for a reason. He has a 4.15 ERA this year with just a 21% strikeout rate. If you're getting Robbie Ray minus the strikeouts, you're not getting Robbie Ray. But Ray has shown some signs of turning it around recently. The velocity for him was super low, concerningly low to open the year. But last time out, his average fastball velocity was 93.8 miles per hour. That is still lower than it was last year, but it is actually in line with 2020 and within a mile per hour of where he was, up 0.7 from his season-long average for this year. He did still walk four guys, but it came with eight strikeouts. His swinging strike rate was 12.6%. So it wasn't a phenomenal start by any means, but it was an improvement from where he was. Now we put Ray back at home 
and have him face the Rays. Ray versus Rays, very confusing for me, but and they're a good team, but they will strike out a bit. They have a 22% strikeout rate versus lefties, down from where it was last year, but this is since the uh, start of last year, their current active roster since the start of last year. So I am worried about Ray. The walks are still high. The velocity is still low, and he has had stretches similar to this in the past where things didn't always click for him. But what Ray has is a path to a ceiling, which you don't typically find for $8,900. And I'm willing to take a shot on that for 89 here, given that he is a value guy for this slate. So I would rank him below Nola because Nola has at least had the good strikeout numbers so far this year, whereas Ray has not. But I'd put him above Lazardo, above Logan Webb, above some other guys. So to me, I think it is um, McClanahan 1, Nola 2, Ray 3, as far as the pitching options go for today. Moving on to the stacks, we got the Twins out in Baltimore for today. And finally, the weather on the East Coast heating up. Temperature there is 68 degrees. It's not a great park for hitting right now, given the, the porch being moved back and left. But I do still think the Twins against Spencer Watkins are the top stack of the night. And Watkins' results this year have been really good. His ERA is 2.55, and he is getting more ground balls this year than he did last year. I think he's doing that because he's leaning less on his fastball. Probably a good thing for him. But the issue is that the peripherals for Watkins aren't as high on him as the results. He has as many walks as strikeouts so far this year, 10.5% each. He's still letting up a 39% hard hit rate, and his expected ERA is 4.61. So basically, he's been able to work his way around calamity pretty often, but probably not in a way that is sustainable going forward. We did see Watkins let up a couple dingers to the Angels back on April 23rd. The Red Sox had a 47% hard hit rate against him last week. So I do believe that Watkins is better than he was last year, but I question if he's better enough where we should avoid stacking against him. And I think that the, the his being better part should stick, but I'm not sure if he'll be better enough where we should avoid stacking against him. So I'm fine putting the Twins at the top of my list here as a result of that for today. The interesting thing here for the Twins is we might not need the value because a lot of the top stacks for today are pretty low salary, but I kind of want to take a look at Jose Miranda. Uh, he's been hitting in the middle of the order since he got called up. He's bat batted sixth, fifth, and fifth across the three games. And two of those were against righties. And Miranda is a good prospect, hit the ball crazy well in AAA last year. He got called up and the results in AAA this year were not blazing, but he was still hitting for some power. He is minimum salary, $2,000. So I would include Miranda in stacks, especially if it helps me get to more Byron Bucks. And I don't think I'll need to use him because, again, a lot of the other stacks are pretty low salary for today. Buxton's only 41, so I can get to him pretty easily. But I do think that Jose Miranda is worth your attention for minimum salary, especially if you do need some extra flexibility for today. Now, the second stack we'll discuss is in that same game. And I'm not sure if I'd rank it second, but figured we were here anyway. Um, and I think we should stop, talk about the Orioles for today. Facing Chris Archer, and Archer is pretty similar to Spencer Watkins, where he's had decent results in four starts, but the peripherals are not good. And I think that means we can stack the Orioles here. The big for, thing for Archer is all the fly balls. He's let up a 51% fly ball rate this year. It was 52% in a small sample last year. And that can work for some guys, especially this year where the balls aren't going as far. But you really got to limit hard contact and limit balls in play for that to work. And Archer does limit balls in play, but it's mostly because his walk rate is 14%. And his hard hit rate is 40%. So basically what you're doing is when he does let up balls in play, he's getting into super dangerous spots. It hasn't been him so far. But it can it can bite pretty fast. And Archer is doing this while not pitching super deep in the games. He's going four or so innings each time. And I'd expect him to be around there again today, which means we do need to game plan around the Twins' bullpen, which is not bad. They're not elite either, though. And they're not one we need to avoid. The Orioles are a big-time uh, fly ball team. They have a 40% fly ball rate against lefties. That is the highest mark on the slate. So, again, we do want to downgrade this park due to the the pushback porch and left and fly balls may not be as valuable this year with the bad balls, but I do still think the long-term process play will be to target pitchers like Chris Archer, let up a lot of fly balls, some hard contact that puts me on the O's here. And I do want to give preference to lefties 
due to the porch and left and due to other stuff, of course, as well, which means I'm, I'm okay bumping up Cedric Mullins and Anthony Santander. I am not entirely opposed to Rugnet Odor either. He is at least getting some power against righties this year. Got a 53% fly ball rate. So I think I'd start with those three guys, Odor, Mullins, Santander, and then go with the righties after that. So prioritize lefties here on this Orioles team. Take advantage of the fact that the that right field did not get changed too much and go from there when it comes to them. As far as the third stack go, Jose Urquidy is facing the Tigers for today. Urquidy has struggled to open this year. He has a 5.95 ERA across four starts, and part of that is the tough team CSAs. It's been a tough schedule. But I do think we can stack the Tigers here. Urquidy's past two starts have been against the Jays, and he faced the Angels in his first start. And that's a pretty tough road to face, but... Where Keedy is struggling to a point where I don't want to fully write off his issues as being a product of the tough schedule he has faced. He has a 15% strikeout rate. His fly ball rate is 50%. He's led up a 51% hard hit rate. And it's led to a 7.21 expected ERA over at Baseball Savant. That's pretty bad. His skill interactive ERA is 4.50. So he should get better as the year goes along. But those issues are legit and they are concerning. So I don't want to write them off just because the, the opponents he has faced have been tough. The Tigers definitely are not a tough team. They actually have the second worst WRC plus on the slate based on their current active roster since the start of last year. They strike out plenty, but they can still put the ball in the air. They're playing in some of the best weather on the slate. Depends on whether the roof is open or closed. Even if it's closed, it'd still be probably the, the warmest game on the slate. But if it's open... Boost them up even a bit more. Either way, I do think we should be in on the Tigers here due to Rikidi's struggles he has had. One thing to keep in mind here is that Rikidi has had pretty extreme reverse platoon splits uh, since the start of last year. Last year, he led up a 455 slugging percentage to righties versus 339 to lefties. And we've shown seen the same thing for Rikidi in a small sample this year, too. The Tigers do have some lefties and some switch hitters at the top, but they do have good righties in there. Javier Baez, the big power guy, he's a righty. Spencer Torkelson gets bumped up against a lower strikeout guy. It's been his key issue so far this year is a lot of strikeouts. For Keedy, not getting a lot of those right now. Eric Haas, if he plays, he's $2,200. He's typically very good against righties. So I wouldn't avoid the lefties, but I would bump up the righties more than you typically would because of Rikidi's reverse platoon splits he has shown over the past couple of years. Let's move now to things to watch and talk about Logan Webb because, again, I'm typically a very Logan Webb type guy. I tend to love him. He is on the slate. He's at home. Super cold park. And he's the highest salary guy. As you know, I don't care about that too much. I'll happily pay up if I think it's the right spot. But doesn't quite do it for me today. He is not striking out a ton of people to open the year. He's throwing a lot of change-ups. And that doesn't seem to be a big whiff pitch for him. Facing the Cardinals, they are a low strikeout team against righties. So Webb does check a lot of my typical boxes, and I usually do love him, but not for today. So no Logan Webb for me for today. I'm sure I'll be back on him eventually, but I want to see that strikeout rate climb back up first. If you stack the three teams we discussed, the Twins, the Orioles, and the Tigers, you're going to have an excess of salary to spend. I would allocate that on the Phillies if you're looking for a place to splurge. So They're facing Taiwan Walker, who is getting more ground balls in a small sample this year. And that sample, both his two starts that come against the Phillies. That's why they weren't higher on this list. The fact that he's done some interesting stuff against them to open the year, but they've already seen him twice. Walker has struggled with hard contact, or at least he did last year. So the Phillies firmly on the menu and a team I would turn to if you have extra salary to spend. Bucks and obviously priority one, but then the Phillies would be number two in terms of if you can find studs, I would go there. Finally, the Astros will likely get quite a bit of buzz for today. They are decently heavy favorites against the Tigers, uh, which means their implied total will be higher. They're facing Tarek Skubal. He's played pretty well ever since he started throwing more sinkers and fewer four seamers, which is something he did, I think, over his final seven or so starts last year, first 12 this year, too, when he's especially getting more ground balls. So I understand liking the Astros. They're facing a lefty. They have a lot of righties in the lineup. It's a warm park, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm likely to be lower on them than the consensus here, especially if they do get buzzed up as a result of that high implied team total. So the Astros... An option for sure. Not going to say no to them, but I do want to be lower on them than the public because I believe what Scooble has done so far. Let's finish up here with the home run calls for today. It's my first day back. I know he was out of the lineup yesterday, but like 
How can I not go Byron Buxton? I know, again, the porch is pushed back and left, but he's facing Spencer Watkins, low strikeout guy. Buxton has been fine when he's played uh, post the hit by pitch and the knee injury. So give me Byron Buxton as my boring home run call. No other possible way I could have uh, come back into uh, work for this week. The fun one, we'll stick in that game and go to the Orioles here. Anthony Santander, I think he is fantastic. He puts the ball in the air a lot against righties. Um, I think he's a very good player. He's played pretty well so far this year. So the home run calls for today, Byron Buxton, the boring one, Anthony Santander, the fun one, very on brand for me. If you listen to this podcast for a couple of years. That is all that we have here for today on the Solo Shot. Good to be back in the saddle once again, breaking down some MLB DFS for you. And we'll be back here every weekday, as always, Monday through Friday, breaking down each day's MLB DFS slates. So make sure you are subscribed to the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed to get that podcast right as it is posted. And also uh, check us out. If you you like what you hear, leave us a rating and review as well. If you've got questions for me, I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to everyone for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your MLB DFS lineups. We'll talk to you once again on Friday to close out the week. This has been the solo shot right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network.